currently serving as your um, additional Motmim Tarbiyat Rishanata. This department is a new department that which is introduced by Hazrat Khalifa Masih Ayodhara Ta'ala bin Aziz in 2020. The purpose of this department is to assist you uh, in the process of getting married by reminding Qudam of their responsibilities as husband, husbands and matchmaking as well. Since I started this uh, post uh, about a year ago, uh, a little bit less than a year ago, uh, we did some data analysis to see you know, with how many Qudam are married that are in marriageable age, which we think is around 25, but it varies from person to person. So what we found was that Khudam from the age of 26 to 30, only 20% of them were married. That's fine, maybe they were finishing up medical school, something like that. Um, but from 30 to 35, we found that only 38% were married. And from 35 to 40, 56%. And this is based on the Nikah data from the Jamaat. So, we know marriage is half our faith. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu said this. But half our khudam in marriageable age or above marriageable age aren't married. It makes one wonder. What, what are we doing? How are we fulfilling our emotional, spiritual, um, and physical need, needs? Uh, are we dating? Are we watching porn? It's interesting. At this very mosque, four years ago, Hazur Akhtas Ayyadala gave a khutbah. In this khutbah, he touched on the harms of pornography. He said it can lead to adultery, domestic violence, unlawful relations, and even the mistreatment of children. It destroys your brain. Think about it. It's been four years. Our Khalifa made the effort to come to America. He gave this khutbah here at this mosque. We're back here. Have you made any improvement? Hazura said, that this is a sin, it's an adultery of the mind, as Hazrat Masima Salam describes. And if you're dating, if you're in a premarital relationship, think about this. I met Hazur in March, and I mentioned Hazur sometimes, Khudam are in premarital relationships. What, what do we tell them? He said that if you're in a premarital relationship, then you're violating your bed. You pledge to put your faith over worldly matters, but you're breaking that pledge. The very act of dating is placing the world over your faith. But my brothers, if you're taking part in these vices, don't lose hope. Repent, do astaghfar. We believe in a merciful God whose mercy and his ability to forgive knows no, knows no bound. So just repent and reform. I also want to emphasize the importance of marriage in Islam. In chapter 30, verse 22 of the Quran, it says, And one of his signs is this, that he has created wives for you from among yourselves, that you may find peace of mind in them. And he has put love and tenderness between you. And that surely are signs for a people who reflect. Marriage gives us peace of mind, and it puts love and tenderness between us. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu said, O oh, young men, whoever among you can afford it, let him get married, for it is effective in lowering the gaze and guarding chastity. Why is this important? Why do we have to guard our chastity? In Surah Mu'minun, in the sixth verse, so Surah Mu'minun, it, it tells you the conditions of taqwa, the conditions of being a successful believer. In its sixth verse, it mentions the conditions of chastity. So without this chastity, you cannot have a successful relationship with Allah. And that's why we're here, to form a successful relationship. Hazrat Masih Maud said, For when God created Adam, it was his wife who was made the first object of his love. Therefore, he who does not love his wife or has no Life to love, wife to love, cannot attain the status of perfect man and lacks one of the conditions of intercession. Even if he is sinless, he is not capable of intercession. As Masih continues, such a person who marries becomes 
habituated towards love and sympathy, and the sphere of this habit then extends to encompass everyone. But those who live a life of celibacy like yogis find no opportunity to extend this habit, and their hearts are left hard and arid. So we cannot reach our full potential as believers without getting married. When you're not married, you're, lack, uh, you're deprived. You're deprived of emotional, physical, and a spiritual connection which will make our hearts soft, which will make us love everyone around us more. And marriage can also become a means to fulfill the rights of man. For me personally, now that I'm married, when I serve, serve humanity, it's a sacrifice for me, right? Because, uh, you know, I have my wife, I have my kid, I have to walk away from them to fulfill the rights of man. And I feel like Allah Ta'ala uh, recognizes that. Before that, it was easy. Uh, going to the mosque and doing a food drive, all those things, I was with my friends, I was hanging out. I don't know what my intention was. Now I know my intention is I'm walking away from something I love to serve my fellow man. So, we get it. And marriage is important, right? But, but now, okay, I gotta get married, what do I do? Well, you need to reflect. Before you start this process, you need to know what your purpose is, right? As Muslims, our purpose is stated in the Quran, chapter 51, verse 57. Allah Ta'ala says, and I have not created the jinn and the men, but that they may worship me. And we all know this is our means to contentment and a happy life, right? Is, is, Realizing this purpose to worship Allah and then acting on it, fulfilling the rights of God and fulfilling the rights of man. So naturally, if this is our ultimate goal, we need to find a partner whose goals um, align with this. So we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to be humble, right? In terms of being honest with yourself, you need to reflect on your purpose before you get into this process. What are your goals in life? Are you just trying to make money, drive a nice car, um, that's it? Or are you trying to attain God, are you trying to become amongst His beloved and be accepted by Him and have eternal happiness, right? Um, we're all at an ishma. I think it implies that we're all pursuing the latter. But be honest with yourself and reflect so you're not in a situation where you're saying, you know, I want someone righteous, I want someone that can help me realize my purpose of uh, attaining Allah Ta'ala, and then, and then you reject them because deep down you want something else, right? And humility, humility is, a, is a key. You should fear Allah. You know, the four verses recited at uh, Nikah that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu selected himself. He handpicked these. There's four verses. Five times the word taqwa is mentioned. The fear of God is mentioned. Five times. Hazur Akhtas Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Asul Aziz says taqwa is the foundation for a successful marriage. And just, you know, bringing it back to my own personal life, once, I, once we have that compass, that Qibla, right? If I'm wrong on something, or my wife's wrong, we can always go back to our scripture, we can always go back, go back to the Quran, the Hadith, Hazrat Masimah, Hazrat Musimah, all our Khulufa and beloved Hazur. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, I have to put, put my head down, right? There's no, there's no personal pride on the line. And once you reflect on what's important and you set your per personal requirements, you shouldn't have the arrogance to say no on vain things, right? I've seen my personal experience while serving this office that sometimes do their looks or their degree um, or some pre-existing idea that people have of what their wife should be, whether um, it's from watching movies or hanging out with girls before marriage. Even if you're not dating, you just have friendships. Subconsciously, your, your mind's developing this idea of your, uh, of your wife and that, that person may not even exist in real life, right? And then, um, if you're rejecting someone on, on vain things um, and justifying it through other excuses, it's, it's, an ex it, it's extremely hurtful for our sisters. And isn't rejecting someone for a vain reason the epitome of arrogance? And also, you should look at yourself. What do you bring, right? Additionally, it's important to marry for true love. What is true love? Recently, beloved Hazur was... Um, interviewed uh, on the topic of, of true love, and he shared an anecdote. There was, a, there was a girl, she had long flowing hair, she was fair, and she had pristine health, right? Don't, don't think too much about this girl now. Um, and this, this, um, this boy, he fell for her, and he went to her father and he said, I want to marry your daughter. 
And the father says, you don't love her. He says, no, no, I love her. I love her. I want to marry her. Right? So what the dad does, and this is a story. I don't think it's a true story. Um, he gave this girl a tra treatment that made her very sick. He made her very frail. He cut her hair. Um, and then he's like, all right, if you love her, then marry her. So she lost her physical uh, kind of beauty. And the boy started to make excuses. And what the father did is he put that hair in a bowl, and he handed it to the, to the boy and said, this is what you love. Right, this, this hair in a bowl. That's the limit of your love. And Azur says that's a superficial love. And I think I, sometimes all, some of us are all guilty of this. So what is true love then, right? There was an elderly wife of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Maimuna Ta'ala Anha. She passed away 50 years after the death of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she had requested before passing away that at her death, she should be buried at the exact same spot, just outside of Makkah, where she had first met our beloved Prophet Sallallahu on a journey and had been proposed to by him. If, there, if it were true that there was a difference between how the Holy Prophet Sallallahu treated his wives, then how is it that this elderly wife of his was reminiscing on her time with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and harbored these sentiments of deep affection for him after a 50-year period. She loved, she tru truly loved the Holy Prophet Sallallahu What was the basis of this? It was taqwa. It was due to the loving treatment she received from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Despite being a, a, a widow and from another nation, he conferred on her status, love, and respect to such a degree that recalling the Holy Prophet Sallallahu before she passed away, she resolved, ultimately, she wants to return to that exact spot where she met, uh, first met the Holy Prophet Sallallahu And this is achieved through taqwa. You'll fulfill the rights of your wife. Right now, I'd like to call um, a, good, uh, a good example, a personal story, um, Dr. Abdul Nasir MK. He's serving as our Naib Sadr. Uh, and inshallah, he'll share his personal story with us. Assalamu alaikum, Nasir Bhai. How are you doing? Wa alaikum assalam, I'm doing good, Alhamdulillah. So I was speaking to Nasir Bhai a few days ago. He was kind enough to do this last minute. Uh, and I really liked his story. So uh, Nasir Bhai, before we get into your process, stuff, can you give us a little bit of background about where you grew up and how you came to America? I, I'm originally from India, uh, South India. But I grew up in West Africa, a country called the Gambia. I did my high school there. And then my dad said, you should go to U.S. to do your studies. So that's how I ended up in the U.S. And, and how old were you uh, when you were here? I was 16. I graduated high school early. So I was 16 when I came to this country. I uh, didn't have family here. So, so you were 16, year old, 16 years old by yourself uh, in a foreign country. I think we all have that, that student in our class that's like 16, year, 16 years old and they're in class with us and you're like 25 and you're thinking what's going on. So um, Nasir Bhai, uh, when did marriage come in the picture for you and how did it come in the picture for you? Right, so you know, when you're 16, I think you know, for, for those of you who are young, when you go off to college, that is a transition period, right? You're, before that, you're with your parents and then when you go off to college, you have a lot of independence so I also went through that. I mean, I was with my parents before I came to this country. And then, you know, college is, uh, there, there are a lot of good things happening. You can pick up a lot of uh, skills. You can learn new things. But morally and spiritually, it's not the best environment, right? You have to be really careful. There's a lot of uh, things going on around you. So as I stayed in this country, as I, I, was, I went through college, I felt the need that I should have a righteous companion um, that will be my, you know, in Islam uh, there is a hadith that says that marriage is a fortress for you, it's supposed to protect you. So that was what motivated me to uh, get married. I had to tell my parents that, hey look, I'm ready to get married. Because I, I think a lot of our parents, they think that you should be perhaps older, 30, maybe above 30 when you get married. So I had to tell my parents, hey, look, I really want to get married. So I think uh, a few important points were hit here. I think one thing Nasir Bhai had was that honesty with himself. 
He said, I'm in this environment, this immoral environment. I probably won't survive unless I'm at least in the process, right? Uh, and another thing I've seen that people struggle with is that conversation with parents. And Nasir Bhai was willing to have that. And I have a friend who, he had an older sibling, he couldn't get married. He got into medical school and he said, I need to get married. And his parents like, you got, you got a brother ahead of you. He said, look, I'm moving to a different city. If you don't get me married, I'm going to marry a nurse, right? And that put the pressure on his parents to get him married. But you have to be brave when you bring this up. Um, so Jazak on Nasir Bhai. And then the process itself, how was that? So yeah, it, it was challenging to get uh, married because I didn't have family here. So the way it worked was that there was a Jamaat family. I was in Minnesota at the time. They, would, uh, they were assisting me with finding a match. And it was, a, it was challenging in the sense that there were a couple of uh, proposals that came through the Jamaat system, but then it didn't work through. I, uh, you can say that the girl side rejected my proposal. So it was challenging in that sense. But for me, my perspective was that I will pray about it. I'll continue to pray about it. There is a dua in the Holy Quran. Allah Ta'ala says, Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zuriyatina kurata ayunin wa jalna lil muttaqina imama. So the summary is that, oh Allah, grant, of, grant us uh, of our spouses those uh, who are pleasing to our eyes, right? So that was the dua that I recited a lot during those days. Uh, I continue to recite it. Ji, and I, I think um, this point of rejection uh, is something all of us fear deep down, and that's sometimes why we hesitate. But I think upon reflecting, every time you get rejected, you, you, and you, know, you find your wife eventually, it becomes a source of blessings. I thank God that that person rejected me, because now, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm happy. And uh, Nasir Bhai, can you tell us about, you know, you were praying, and um, you did end up getting married, alhamdulillah. And, uh, uh, what happened uh, and what indication did you have that you know your wife was the one? Right, so as I went through those uh, proposals and rejections and so on, eventually, so I grew up in the Gambia, so my family, they knew another family, the Jamaat family there in the Gambia. And my mom said, hey, you know, the other family, they have a daughter, so I think she will be a good match for you. So that was how the proposal started. This family uh, had moved to London, so uh, her, my wife's dad, he's a murabi in London. And uh, so my wife is fortunate in the sense that she was uh, one of the few waqifate no that were in London when Huzur initially moved uh, at the beginning of his Khilafat. So she, uh, Huzur knows her by name, and Huzur had told her family that, you know, if you have any marriage proposals, Huzur would approve it. Huzur would have to approve it before she gets married. So my uh, proposal was presented and Huzur approved it. And that was a big sign for me that, uh, Alhamdulillah, this uh, worked out for me. And that's how I got married eventually. Jazakallah. And, and the reality is, is Huzur can be part of all of our processes. We can um, write to him. Uh, and that's one of the biggest blessings we have. So hold fast that rope. Jazakallah, Nasir I appreciate you coming up here and sharing your story. Jazakallah. alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So another, another point I'd like to address is uh, your responsibility as an Ahmadi, right? You're not living life for you. A lot has happened for you to be sitting here in this, in this ishtamaga. We carry an immense burden. And it's, if it's a burden you think about, it, it's just, it shakes you to your core, right? I mean, all of our families in one way or another, or if someone's converted, they've sacrificed everything. Those of us who came from Pakistan, find out what happened. How did our families get here? My father was escaping an attempted murder charge, uh, a bogus attempted murder charge, right? And to this day, Ahmadis are suffering in Pakistan, in Algeria, in Afghanistan, and we're eating their fruits. So we don't get to just sit here and marry someone and not fulfill our obligations. As Ahmadis, when, we're, when we face Allah Ta'ala on the Day of Judgment, He'll take all those things into account. We accept the Hazrat Nasim out. We have His teachings. We have a Khalifa. We're the only ones with the Khalifa. How are you going to face God? Hazur said that the next 20 to 25 years 
are crucial for the Jamaat. That's us and that's our kids. If you marry out, your kids are going to do nothing for the Jamaat. And you'll do nothing for the Jamaat. And we have a responsibility to our sisters. Because if we don't marry them, who will? And how sad and how much pain must it cause Hazur when one of his daughters, his spiritual daughters, can't get married? Think about that. Think about that responsibility. Now I will call uh, Salam Bhatti Saab to share his, his personal story. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, Jazakallah for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, to the audience during this uh, really incredible session. Um, I wanted to start by asking the, a question to the audience. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have a, a great group here. Uh, how many of you, by, by show of hands, how many of you are single and ready to get married? Okay, great. Keep your hands up. How many of you are single and ready to get married? Qasim, I said single, okay? I, uh, <laughs> I sure have too. How, if you are single and ready to get married, but your parents won't let you get married, keep your hands up. All right, okay, we see, I see a couple hands. All right, how many of you are single and ready to get married but can't find a spouse? All right, a few more hands. Okay, so my message is really for you few people and also for the rest of the audience who may know people in that demographic. And why is it that audience that I'm really focused on? It's because you're ready. You have the hormones, you have the pheromones ready to go. But because you have a block, whether it's you can't find a spouse or your parents are saying no, those pheromones, those hormones are gonna catch feelings for somebody else in your vicinity, whether it's at work or whether it's at school. So that's something to be incredibly mindful of. You know the black and white rules uh, that we see in you know, Surah Al-Mu'minun where Allah Ta'ala says that uh, uh, those who will be successful are, are those who uh, guard their chastity uh, except against those who their right hands possess or, or are their spouses. Um, anybody else not guarding their chastity um, is a transgressor. And transgression is a really big deal. You are breaking a law when you are transgressing. And that transgression is, of course, the not guarding your chastity. It's a very important thing, but it's a very difficult thing, especially when you're in the zone of, I'm ready to get married, but I can't. And you're surrounded by women. It's very hard, and it's something that I went through. Uh, when I was in college, I was ready to get married, but my parents said no. And so while I had the hormones that were ready because I was participating in Qudam meetings where the message was coming loud and clear that you should get married young, marriage is great, you should have children, marry an Amity spouse. And I'm like, yes, I'm ready. But when I would go home, my parents weren't ready. And so there was a gap, there was a disconnect, there was a block. And as a result, I ended up catching feelings for a girl when I was in college and introducing the Jamaat to her, and she ended up converting. But the, the thing that was at the back of my mind for so long, especially when we got divorced, was did she fall in love with me, or did she fall in love with the Jamaat? Or was there a conflict in the two? Was the water muddied? Did I muddy the water? And one of the things that I you know, sometimes get despondent about is, would she have become an Amity if I had remained completely out of the picture? And if so, did I ruin somebody's spiritual journey to find Allah, to find Hazrat Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa and to help somebody find the promised Messiah alayhi salam. So that was a burden that I've been carrying, even though Allah t Allah t tells us not to despair, it's a burden that I've been carrying that I want to make sure that you, my dear brothers, don't carry that burden. You know, there are so many wonderful Amity sisters, and Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me a second chance, and I was able to remarry. Uh, I married a, a wonderful uh, woman from Chicago Jamaat. We have two wonderful children together, and I uh, just, it, I really am able to appreciate how we are told in Islam that uh, your spouse and your children are the delight of your eyes. Uh, and that's not something that I was able to experience that first go around, because 
perhaps it was just surface level. So it, it, in conclusion of this real short um, intro, um, just, just be careful. Be careful out there because especially to you guys who are ready to get married but cannot, understand that you have an advocate with Hazur. Hazur himself has said that if you are wanting to get married and you cannot because your parents won't let you or you can't find a spouse, write to me and I will help you out. You know, that's, that's all we need to know. We've been having this uh, theme of how um, the, the Khalifa feels the pain of every single Ahmadi. And just as uh, Rahman Bay was saying that the next 20 to 25 years are absolutely critical, we cannot be losing our young men to marrying outside of the Jamaat when there is such a wonderful quality, a group of ladies who are waiting for you uh, and, and, and willing and able to, to marrying you. So just some things to uh, chew on. Uh, and uh, I'm, always, I'm always available to talk uh, with you guys if you're experiencing something uh, like I went through or if you're experiencing something different. And you just need somebody to talk with. Uh, and I'm, I'd be happy to talk with you. Jazakallah, Salam Bhai. And I think, you know, being in universities and experiencing, um, you know, study groups, all these other things, it's really easy to fall into that temptation. And that's why Naib Sadr Sahib's example was important, is recognizing that and making an active effort to combat that and not justifying um, even friendships with, with the girls in your classes. Make, keep it strictly professional if you have to. Otherwise, just avoid that interaction and have faith that Allah Ta'ala will provide you a righteous spouse that will lead you towards God. Um, Jazakallah, salam bhai. Okay, I appreciate cool. it. And uh, now I'll share my own personal story only because I feel like my story is one that can give uh, anyone who's looking to get married hope. Um, so I always, you know, since I was maybe 16, 17, wanted to get married early. My mom had a cousin who she wanted me to marry, but after four years of considering that, she rejected me. She just said, uh, I'm, not, I'm not interested. And for me, it wasn't a matter of, um, like, I really want to marry this cousin, but I knew she was regular in her prayers, and she observed Pertha, and she had an attachment with the Jamaat. So I didn't want to have the ar arrogance to say no to someone with those qualities. And then down the road, those essential qualities I don't get. Uh, but once I was rejected, um, you know, I, I moved on. I, I was in a rough place in life, not because of the rejection, but just because I was slacking off in school. Um, I had a 2.0 GPA. I had been suspended academically. Uh, I was back in school trying to recover everything. Uh, and I told my good friend, Dr. Bilal Rana, that, hey, man, I want to get married. Help me out. Um, my parents weren't having it. They were like, no girl's going to marry him got no trajectory, it's going to be nothing. So Bilal Rana Sahib actually called my dad and he said, wait, there may be people out there that will look past his you know, academic struggles and marry him for other reasons. Uh, so based on that, my parents allowed me to start the process and my grades started to improve as well. Um, so I started pursuing Arisha. I saw something on social media of a Jamaat girl doing a lot of uh, khidmat, right? Like helping out the Jamaat a lot. And she observed Farda. So I was like, yeah, no, this is it. I want to marry her. Uh, my family sent the proposal. Initially, I happened to be in the city she lived, so Bilal, I was like, why don't you go meet the family? That weekend, um, someone in her family had passed away. So then I, um, you know, we set a date to get married. At the same time, my close friend, uh, Tariq Bhakti Sahib, Marhum, uh, was uh, in the late stages of his stage four cancer. Um, and you know, as that date was coming to, to meet the family, his health continued to deteriorate. And I was praying fervently, I was doing a Sahara prayer. But in my mind, the, and I had a friend doing a Sahara as well, actually. And he said he had a bad, he had a bad dream. Um, and, and for me, I didn't see any dream, but you know, I was like, ah, it's his dream. Seems like a good prospect, let's keep moving forward. Um, then what happened was, the day I was meant to go fly out to her city, Tariq Pai passed away. And, you know, we postponed the meeting um, and said, we'll just come later. It's okay. These things happen. But what ended up happening is that same weekend I was supposed to go, someone else came. And they entertained that Rishta. And then they said, hey, if you guys want to come and we can compare. And I said, no, we're depending on prayers and we expect the same from you. So we're just going to move on. Um, that happened. But for me, that was a sign. That was the answer to my Sahara, right? What are the odds that when I'm going there, this happens, I can't go and they entertain someone else. That's an indication to me from God that this isn't good for you. 
So then I started praying because I had nowhere to go, and I, I recalled a family I visited in London one time, and they had MTA playing, and they were very hospitable. So we proposed to them. They had a daughter. When we proposed to them, um, I actually went there. I met the family. I didn't meet, uh, I didn't meet my now wife. Um, I really liked the family. They really liked me, but the decision was with my wife. Uh, and she took her time. She, had, she was finishing up school and things like that. So three or four months, I had no answer. Uh, and I figured maybe, uh, uh, actually, I was at Beit Rahman, and someone came up to me maybe four months later and was like, hey, are you, are you looking for Arisha? I'm like, well, look, you know, I was, I'm in these talks, but they're obviously not interested. But for the sake of you know, respecting them and all that, I'll have my mom call them, and tomorrow you can tell me about this Arisha. Right? As, as this was going on, I was praying. So I called my mom. I said, hey, someone's interested, and obviously they're not. So why don't you just officially close the book there? We can move on. So my mom's like, OK, I'll call them. Before she could call, my mother-in-law, my now mother-in-law, called her and said that, yes, we're down. Let's do it. And for me, in my heart, I took it as this has to be God. The, the day, four months, the day I want to close the book, or I'm trying to move on, it's confirmed, right? So that also shows istikharas can be answered um, in different ways. And it's not that you know, I'm some righteous guy that prays. I'm, I'm probably the biggest sinner in this room. Allah knows. I'm guilty of a lot. But Allah Ta'ala has, has mercy on sinners like me, and He'll have mercy on sinners like you, inshallah. But I, I, before I conclude, I do want to touch on the Issachara prayer because there seems to be some confusion, right? A lot of people say you have to see a sign, you have to see a dream. What, in, what is an Issachara? It's a prayer to seek guidance from God Almighty when one intends to embark on an important task, whether it be trade or journey or marriage. The purpose of this prayer is to seek God's help so the outcome of this task in hand is successful. You offer two nafal rakat, you recite some specific surahs and a specific dua, which I'll read in a minute. Um, but there's no required sign. Sometimes a sign is just nothing wrong happened, and it moved forward and it worked out. That's enough. And my, my challenge to you is don't knock it till you try it. Yesterday, Naib Amir Saab came and talked about how much time you waste on Netflix. It takes five minutes a night before you sleep. Make it part of your routine. And Pray on even if you don't have a prospect. Just, just start praying to offer two nuffle for your marriage and a righteous spouse. And what do we pray when we pray a Sahara? Here's a translation of this Sahara prayer. Oh Allah, I seek good from thee out of thy knowledge, and I seek power from thee out of thy power, and I beg of thee out of thy boundless grace. For thou hast power, and I have no power. And thou hast knowledge, and I have no knowledge. And thy knowledge encompasses the unseen. O oh Allah, if it be with it thy knowledge that this task is for my good, both materially and spiritually, and in respect of my ultimate end, then make it possible for me, and bless me therein. But if it be within thy knowledge that it is harmful for me in my spiritual and material life, and in respect of my ultimate end, then turn me away therefrom and enable me to attain good wherever it may be and cause me to be blessed therewith. Such a beautiful prayer. It encompasses everything. And that's why you trust Allah. That's why you embrace rejection. That's why you, you, you make the courage to talk to your parents. Because we're praying that we get the best outcome for our ultimate end. So what are the next steps? You're sitting here. You're deprived. You're alone. What do you do? You reflect. Reflect on your purpose. What do you want from this life? When you're on your deathbed, what do you want to have? Do you want to have a big house uh, with no real purpose? Or do you want to be one of those who's praying that they're accepted by God? And pray for a spouse that helps you reach Allah. Write to beloved Hazur. His prayers and his guidance are our biggest blessing. He is the closest man to God today on this planet. Just try it. And start having open conversations with your family. I see a lot of people are embarrassed to talk to their parents. What do you have to lose? You have to be brave. Talking to your parents as an Ahmadi Muslim about marriage is the smallest thing on your plate. 
We have to be ready, ready to sacrifice our life, our wealth, our time, and our honor. So what's saying, Mom, I want to get married. I'm struggling. It's really hard out here. If you don't get me married, I'm going to marry a nurse. Say it. Whatever works. And what can we do? We can try to help. We can advocate on your behalf. Like Bilal Rana advocated for me, and uh, Dr. Bilal Rana said, who advocated for me. He, he, um, we can do that for you. We can share our own experiences and our knowledge uh, and try our best to help you. Jamaat has a department, Rishanata, that helps with matchmaking. So if your family doesn't have anyone they want to suggest for you, you can go through the Jamaat. We also help with matchmaking. But ultimately, Allah Ta'ala makes the matches. We propose a match, we pray for the best, and you, what you can do is you can be humble, you can pray, and you can recognize that I don't know what's best for you. Your parents don't know what's best for you, and you definitely don't know what's best for you. Allah Ta'ala knows what's best for you. So trust your prayers. It will give you contentment throughout your marriage that this is your other half that God selected. The process itself, it's tough, it's difficult, but it will bring you closer to Allah if you lean on Allah. I pray that we can fulfill our responsibilities as Ahmadi Muslims. We can raise a generation of devout servants to the Jamaat. We can become a source of happiness for our beloved Azur. And we can be among those lucky souls that Allah Ta'ala accepts. Jazakumullah. This concludes the session.